Hello and welcome to another episode of the Monday Mile podcast. This week we're linking up with Team GB rugby sensation Abby Burton. Now, Abby's story is far from normal. A Tokyo 2020 Olympian and an athlete campaigning to improve body confidence. Her career hasn't been straightforward. With a serious bout of ill health in 2022, with a serious bout of ill health in 2022 and a misdiagnosis of experiencing a psychotic episode actually turned out to be autoimmune encephalitis. Abby, <laughs> welcome to the Monday Mile podcast. Oh, this is super cool. No, look at the sun, sun shining, walking by the river, couldn't ask for anything better. It's a vibe, isn't it? It is, it is. <laughs> How are you today? I'm doing good. Like, as I said, being outside is just my happy place. So yeah, doing good. How is yourself? You know what? I'm really, really good. And I'm so excited to have a little chat with you because your story is, is quite mind boggling. And seeing you turn up today and your smile, it's, it's so, so infectious. First off, why rugby? Because it seems as though it's in the burn blood. Yeah, so traditionally, well, growing up, I didn't actually play rugby at all. Like literally just watched my dad and my brothers play. And that was it. Like I'm really competitive in swimming and athletics, do every other sport other than rugby. But I always wanted to be like my dad. And I think that that's, I know it's so cliche, isn't it? Oh, you want to be like your parents, but I've always just wanted to do what anything that he did and having two younger brothers as well, who were always a bit rough and tumble. You always got involved in it, even in the, even in the living room. I tell you, I've been tackled really? onto the, tackled onto the What's sofa. What's the age difference? So two years. Two years. Yeah. So they're actually like grown men now, but yeah, I, I, I like say. to say that they're my little baby brothers. So <laughs> you definitely won't be tackling them now. No, definitely not. They are a lot bigger than me now. I'd actually get braid now. <laughs> so from swimming, to rugby. Yeah, there's just something about it that like just makes me me. It makes me whole and it brings out all the best characteristics of me. And that's why I love it so much. And that's why like I carry on doing it now. So yeah. Take me to that moment. Olympics, Tokyo 2020. Yes. You are officially named as a part of the Team GB team. Literally, I came home from camp because we'd had a camp and then they said, oh, we'll send out selection as soon as you get home. I was so nervous that the only thing that could calm my nerves was a Toby Carvery. So I said to my mum, I was like, mum, we need to go to Toby Carvery. So me and one of my brothers went. My other brother didn't want to be anywhere near me in case it was bad news. He came through at 7 p.m. And literally, I remember looking at my phone and I was like, it's 6.58, it's 6.58. Like, I don't know, mum, I don't know if I'm going to go. And literally, it came up and I was just burst into tears. And it was so emotional. and. At that moment, I watched my mum and dad in the kitchen and they were just like crying their eyes out. Like, and I think it's just the look on each other's faces like she's actually done it. Like I've wanted to do that all my life from being a swimmer, being part of an athletics team as well. And then finally being able to go to the Olympics, even just in rugby was just unbelievable. So you sat at Toby Carvery, did you go chicken or beef? Oh, I go pork. Oh, <laughs> controversial. And you're waiting for an email. Well, we'd actually gone home from the Toby Carvery at that point. I wish that we were actually at the Toby Carvery when it happened, but no, we had gone home after that and we were just sat in the kitchen, just like all just waiting, waiting for it to come through. And what was that experience like going to the Olympics? as a part of Team GB, wearing the uniform, because it is different to yeah. what you do every day. Yeah. I've experienced it. Yeah, it's pretty unique, isn't it really? Like just even from getting the kit, we never get kit like that. With the rugby stuff, we kind of get the bare minimum, and I know it's harsh to say, but we do. And then the fact that just even the kitting out and then being able to say that like, I'm part of, because there's not, rugby's only been in the Olympics, but this Tokyo was the second season that it had ever been in the Olympics. So I was only the second person ever to wear the number three shirt out of the whole of women's rugby for Great Britain. I feel like that's pretty cool in itself. And the experience of the Olympics was very mixed, like with us coming forth. But actually, I wouldn't change it for the world. It was one of the greatest experiences that I've ever had. Being in the mix with other sports as well, how did you find the actual games time environment? Because that's definitely something for me that 
I thrived off. It was obviously a bit unique because of COVID. So like we actually yeah. couldn't communicate or like go near other athletes. So if you wanted a photo, you were standing like two meters away from people. Just to be able to see all these incredible athletes and just think that I'm among like the best in the world, which you never kind of think of yourself, do you? Yeah, like, I know. That, and I was in, when like the food hall's at another level, it's unbelievable, like the amount of people are in there who have just dedicated their life to the sport. And I guess that's kind of a weird way to think about it when you're sitting, eating dinner, <laughs> like literally. But that's what I thought about, that I'm surrounded by people who think the exact same as what I do, which is quite a unique experience, I think. It's like a seal and a stamp. You are one of the world's elite. Yeah. You've been recognised as one of the best in the world. Do you hold that close to your chest? It's difficult because like sometimes I don't think of it like that, but actually I sometimes have to help myself get to that point of like, oh, I am actually one of the best in the world, especially when I have like low confidence and stuff like that. It's definitely one of those experiences that only the best in the world have ever had so no one can ever take that away from me. Do you suffer with low confidence? I used to a lot before I was poorly, just feeling not good enough and just feeling like, from like a body image point of view, but then also that within sevens rugby, I don't look like a typical sevens player. I'm a lot heavier than the majority of sevens players. I'm not as quick. And I struggle to figure out where I actually fit into an actual squad because I don't look like sevens players per se. And that just affected my confidence so much, especially from when I was 18, probably until the Olympics. Like I really, really struggled with my confidence and just didn't feel like I was good enough to be in the squad. You played in 15s prior to that and yeah. still do now was the sevens like an automatic transition or was it just that olympic target it, it was a, the olympic target like as i said that i'm not really like a sevens built player so i didn't even ever think that it would be on my radar to be able to play sevens at the olympics and i got a call one day after i'd finished my last day level exams saying oh we want you to be a part of the olympic sevens squad and i was like okay like i didn't never thought i'd ever get that's an opportunity huge. like that. It was crazy. I'd literally sat my last A-level exam, 18 years old, and they were like, yep, yeah, you need to pack up your stuff, move down to London at 18 years old. I'd lived away at home at college, but like this was a whole different kettle of fish. Like I was going like four and a half hours away from my family. It never was like a direct route for me. I always thought that, yeah, I want to probably go to a World Cup. I want to go and play my rugby that way. And I kind of, and it sounds weird, but I'd come to the realisation that I might never go to an Olympics because I'm not the build for it. I'm not like a natural sevens player. So then when I did, I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. Smash down that barrier, <laughs> having none of that. <laughs> You're now back on the pitch. Mm -hmm. Quite the drastic turnaround, yeah. which is incredibly impressive. Yeah. Does it scare you that it could happen again? I think for me, because we don't know what's caused it, however, speaking to different neurologists and stuff like that, they have made it abundantly clear that they think it's safe for me to return to rugby. And they've said that if I'm going to relapse, it is not going to be down to rugby, if that makes sense. Like yeah. me hitting my head would not cause me to relapse because it wasn't my head being hit in the first place that caused me to have encephalitis. They have said though that if I was a boxer or something like that, then I would never be able to do that again. So if I did any direct head contact sports, I would not be able to do anything again. They've just said, if I'm going to relapse, I'll relapse. They can't stop it. And for me, I can't live my life in fear of if I'm going to relapse or not. Like, and I feel like that's the kind of mindset that I do have now. Traditionally, is it something that once treated, you are sort of safe or there is there a trending theme of yeah, relapsation. because my illness was only discovered in 2007, my type of encephalitis, they don't really have that much research on it. A lot of people do relapse, I'm not going to lie to you, but a lot of people didn't have the treatment that I had. So I had the rituximab, which is the aggressive chemotherapy. One dose of chemotherapy while I was asleep and one whilst I was awake, which was the stuff that caused me to lose my hair, made my face all spotty. Like it was a necessary evil, as my mum would say. But then after that, I was on like 21 tablets a day, which consisted of like two types of anesthesia medication, steroid, calcium tablets, because they thought I like, I could just have a stress fracture. I was a pretty much a mess after I came out of hospital, but 
they're pretty certain that because of how aggressively they treated it, yeah. I won't relapse. And like my doctor, that's unreal. she looked me in the eye and said, I do not think you're going to relapse. And I was like, thank you very much. Let's hope I don't. There always will be a chance. Yeah. That, like I seen a neurologist and he said, you could relapse in two months. You could relapse in five years, you could relapse in 20 years. Like they don't have enough research on it to be able to tell me the chance of me relapsing or not. Now, what's so incredible is how you have continued to move forward mm. in such a positive manner. Has it changed your outlook and perspective on life? Oh, completely. Like, pre-illness, rugby was my everything. And being a professional athlete, you'll know that your sport, majority of the time, it is everything, isn't it? Yeah. For me now, I look at my experience and look at life because there was a point at the start of this year where they thought I'd probably never be able to play again. And you come to the realisation of, is it your everything? And actually, it's not. Rugby isn't my everything anymore. My, my health, my happiness and my family and friends' health and happiness is what means the most to me. And next year we have Paris selection. And if I don't get selected for Paris, it is not the end of the world anymore. Whereas if you would have said that to 20 year old Abby fighting for a place in Tokyo, yeah. like that probably would have destroyed my world. But actually now, after going through what I've went through, it's changed my complete perspective on life. But it also means that I do actually enjoy rugby a little bit more than what I used to, which is weird because you'd think if I don't care about that aspect, I still care about it, but you, you don't like, it's not everything to you anymore. Yeah. But I enjoy it more now because I'm more relaxed. I'm not worrying about that this is my everything. I'm going to be unhappy if I drop a ball in training. I'm literally just like, yeah, next thing. Now, it's just changed everything completely for me. Would you say it's changed what you're defined by, oh, essentially? a thousand percent. I'm no longer defined by Abby Burton on the rugby pitch. Like, I'm defined by the different actions that I do out of that. Like, my coaching, like, the fact that I was able to finish my university degree after doing it for six years part-time and also going through a brain injury. I've watched my young brothers grow into grown men. Like that's what makes me happy. And that's what defines me now is my own happiness, not my happiness on a rugby pitch. So, so <laughs> magic to hear. It's giving me goosebumps.